Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening to our panelists and to all of you who are participating here in person at SICE Europe, but also those of you who are numerous who are following this evening online. We have a very special program for you this evening. Um, the Janneke Albers Memorial Conference Lecture, which in fact is a panel with our four distinguished participants who are going to be discussing with you um, various issues related to global risk, a subject that many of you through our MADR uh, program, but also other programs here at SAIS are very much focused on. This event is uh, a memorial to our alumna, Janneke Albers, uh, who passed away in 2011, uh, sadly, and who had been dedicated to uh, risk and risk prevention, both when she was here and uh, through her career with Oxford Analytica. And this annual event is a memorial in which uh, we remember her contribution here at SAIS Europe. So without more ado, let me hand over uh, to Dr. Veronica Angel, who will chair the session this evening. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Michael. I'm Veronica Angel. I'm adjunct professor of risk in international politics and economics at uh, here at SAIS. And I'm very happy to welcome you all and everyone online um, to this event that is going to focus on uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, political risks that we uh, have to be aware of for the coming year. Um, it is the end of the year and most risk outfits are doing this um, uh, this, this whole uh, roundup of what we should be prepared for next year. So this is a substantive conversation um, that will um, also come in completion to, to complete previous conversations that we've had throughout the day with our guests um, that were more hands-on about uh, having a career in, um, in the risk industry. Um, now, uh, a few rules about how we're going to organize this. Um, we have uh, participants online. I will ask them to um, enter their questions in the, in the Q&A so that I can um, uh, follow this and, and include you in the conversation. Uh, we will start with our panel. Um, each guest will have uh, about six to eight minutes to tell us what they consider um, as the most important um, uh, things to look out for in the coming um, year or in the, let's say medium term. Um, and then we will uh, take over with, uh, with um, uh, questions from you guys. So just a quick round of introductions. Um, you should already be um, intimate with all their biographies as well as with their companies um, because this was practically mandatory uh, part of the syllabus that we are um, um, aware of um, um, your extraordinary career and, and what you do and how we can just aspire to be one of you someday. Um, we will start with um, Oksana Antonenko who is a director of um, uh, on, uh, he was a, di a director at Control Risks in London. Um, John Howey, the regional director for Europe at the Economist Intelligence Unit, um, and also the editor of the very important uh, democracy um, index that we also use in our um, research. Um, and then we will continue with Preston Keat. Uh, who is uh, not uh, the, not a, an, on his first visit to SAIS, that's for sure, uh, the managing director and head of uh, political and country risk at, at UBS. Um, and then we will uh, conclude the round of introductions with uh, Volfango Piccoli, who is a co-president of Teneo and uh, head of research. Um, so we will ask Oksana to start us off. Um, and well, thank you so much for the introduction. So this is uh, my first time participating in the SAIS uh, Bologna Risk Program, although I did come here before to lecture at the uh, International Relations course, you know, many, many years ago while I was still at IISS. Um, so maybe just to start for, for the audience, both, you know, here in the room and online, um, just to introduce very briefly control risks. So it's a global 
um, specialist risk advisory uh, company. Um, we're almost 50 years old uh, and uh, we have a global footprint with um, 37 offices around the world. And one of our key um, sort of annual um, flag flagship publications and, and risk analysis uh, uh, forecast um, is what we call risk map. So it's an annual event, you know, which, you know, we had this year just um, about two weeks ago. So I'm really glad to share with you very quickly our top risks for 2022. And it's usually covers the whole range of risks, not just geopolitical risks, but uh, geopolitical risk, of course, is part of it. So the overall theme for us for 2022, of course, we all are now finishing just yet another disruptive year. Do you remember you know, a lot of forecasts in 2020, talking about, you know, post-COVID world, we're moving away from the pandemic. Clearly that didn't happen in 2021 uh, and uh, uh, unlikely to happen in 2022. However, we believe in 2022, we are now entering the period where a lot of businesses are now not only looking at what is happening now or what happened over the last uh, 12 months, but what is actually going to happen, not only in the three to five year horizon, but even beyond that, uh, you know, up to 2030 and beyond. So it is really a, a year of reflection, a year of trying to understand what the future holds rather than the end to disruption. And we call it really the rise of this transitional world. So the what the pandemic has done, in many ways, it has accelerated the trends that have been there you know prior to the pandemic and one of the trends which was clearly there before the pandemic but you know so now uh, even more pronounced is this kind of end of this uh, world order that was with us you know since the end of the cold war and transition to a new world order uh, yet to be defined so we are clearly left the world order that we were in uh, since the cold war and we are now very much in a period of transition to a new world order which we are still not very clear about who is going to set the terms and conditions for this world. It's clearly not going to be the United States or not the United States alone. Um, will it be a, a cooperative world or the world of competition among uh, several uh, powers or maybe just two powers? Or will it be, as uh, um, several authors called, nobody's world, the world of chaos and the world of uh, uh, spreading instability and security vacuums. So we believe, of course, that it's going to be a combination of all three. But for many businesses, the very fact that we are in transition is the main risk. And we think that 2022 will be more than ever the period of geopolitical transition. So we recently uh, conducted our global risk survey for 2022 among uh, all of our clients. So we work with about 85% of the global uh, Fortune Top 20, 250 companies. So a lot of companies who participated in this survey and 65% of them you know, said that the, they are already re-evaluating re re their long-term strategy uh, in view of changing geopolitical environment. And this is clearly something different. You know, last year, the focus was very much on crisis management and focus on, you know, what is happening with the pandemic. Now, it is much more about, you know, re-evaluating the... Try to operate this. Yeah. Oops. So uh, this grand geopolitical repositioning is our number one top political risk for 2022. Uh, the top security risk for us for 2022 is what we call the rise of dysfunctional, fragile and vulnerable states. Um, I'm sure many of you um, have remember this whole discourse about fragile states. And uh, in the past, we always talked about fragile states as being part of the global south. It is about conflict, it is about global poverty, it's about, you know, lack of development. But actually, the pandemic has demonstrated to us that fragility, the state fragility, is really not only about the global south, although, of course, global south remains to be um, more fragile. But it is also increasingly about the global north. And the state fragility 
is not only about conflict and, and poverty, but increasingly about fragile state institutions and fragile societies. The societies with increased political polarization and societies prone to political violence. And therefore, when we look forward to 2022, it's not only the you know, increasing number of military coups or conflicts in, in Africa or increasing, you know, uh, fragmentations and, and, and challenges of in the Middle East, like Lebanon and Sy or Syria, but it's also about challenging elections in France that we are facing next year and how the politically po polarized society is going to handle it. It's difficult elections in Hungary. It is what is going to happen domestically in the United States uh, uh, around you know domestic politics and, and the violence that we've seen in the United States. So for many businesses that are really um, increasingly looking at the state fragility as a source of their security risk. It is important now to focus not only on the long-term you know, trends underpinning the state fragility, but increasingly on the short-term triggers. Because in this you know, increasingly fragile world and increasing number of external shocks that the states are now experiencing um, after, the, after the, the, the height of the pandemic, we are likely to see the events driving state fragility rather than just underlying trends. So now if we go to the main terrorism risk, this is something which we do uh, at Control Risks every year. We'll look and evaluate what is the key trends in terrorism. And this year, clearly the conversation uh, is more important than before um, for two reasons. One, of course, is that COVID has had a very substantial impact on the drivers behind terrorism, not only the you know the societal fragility that we've seen, the social disruption, the economic damage, but also mental health crisis. We've seen the issues related, you know, generally to um, you know financial relationships and other personal stressors that are driving recruitment for terrorism. We also seen, of course, you know, uh, increasing uh, importance not only from the you know radical religious you know terrorism such as you know we've seen uh, you know in in the 1990s or, or 2000s, but increasingly the right wing extremism that is uh, or left wing extremism that is driving terrorist threats you know all across the world, inclu including of course in, in Europe. Um, and second driver for behind the terrorism risk for 2022, of course, is what is happening in Afghanistan. Um, and here. It is very important, of course, that already today, since the withdrawal of the troops, uh, um, NATO troops and United States troops from Afghanistan, we are seeing now the number of new groups that are operating in Afghanistan, um, potentially planning and, and contemplating, as we know, um, you know, terrorist attacks beyond its borders. And of course, Taliban government is increasingly under pressure now from the international community to try to contain those risks. But there are a lot of doubts whether Taliban is willing or even able, uh, being a movement of it, as it is, you know, to contain those threats. So we really think that the combination of COVID and, you know, what is happening in Afghanistan could drive a new wave of terrorism, which is of course a major source of risk for business. Now going to cyber risks, uh, and this is what we call business versus the world of unchecked cyber threats. Um, we are really seeing again in 2022, and this is really very much reflected by our you know, global risk survey, 80% um, of our clients you know, put cyber risks as number one uh, challenge for them. And they all also agree that the ownership of cyber risks is unclear, and it is unlikely, this is unlikely to change in 2022. So we see, you know, both the increase in, of course, in digitalization, um, which is driving kind of expanding the spectrum um, for uh, uh, cyber risks. And at the same time, of course, the uh, increasing, you know, uh, uh, merger between the states and the criminal groups that are operating jointly um, to uh, target, you know, businesses around the world. Uh, and the cyber risks and cyber threats are likely to a substantially increase, you know, even from uh, the state that we are in, uh, in 2021. And in 2022, of course, it's also a challenge how this whole cyber, global cyber landscape is going to be governed. Who is going to set the parameters for managing the cyberspace? And we feel, and the messages are here from our clients and businesses that are increasingly feeling that they are alone, left alone to manage those risks rather than seeing, you know, governments um, um, being, you know, partners, effective partners for them in managing those risks. 
Um, now going to the next major risk, of course, is the is the impact of climate change and particularly more more extreme weather events. And this is something which we have seen um, already in the last several years. But of course, we know from the um, recent UN reports that uh, the number of climate related disruptions is likely to increase. And for many businesses, it is not just the issue of managing this risk on a case by case basis. It is what businesses need to do is to develop a much more comprehensive and a holistic approach of uh, addressing climate change, not event by event or asset by asset, by, but strategically looking both at, you know, the, the key areas where the uh, operations are, but also, you know, looking at the uh, more longer term forecast of how the climate change is going to impact, you know, their uh, business models going forward. And finally, this is the final risk, <clears throat> is what we call stumbling in the ESG stampede. And this is really for us a top reputational risks. Um, as you know, many businesses um, uh, uh, now are under pressure, under pressure from regulators, under pressure from markets, under pressure from shareholders to you know, really demonstrate very clearly their commitments in the ESG and the environmental, social and governance uh, standards. Um, but uh, what I think is important is that we are not only emphasizing those declarations, but those declarations are accompanied by very concrete actions and that there is a much greater coordination and understanding what, you know, those ESG uh, uh, parameters and, and, and standards are globally around the world. Because we see many businesses at the moment being in this uh, ESG geopolitics trap where different regions are emphasizing, you know, obviously different requirements and uh, to be able to, for global company to be able to meet their, um, uh, their standards and requirements is increasingly difficult. So I'll stop here. Apologies for taking a bit more time. Thank you. That was perfect. Um, thank you. And we will take the control risks of our main um, asset there because we don't want to, you know, prioritize one among many, particularly when we have um, also Joan Hoey here from The Economist um, to take us forward. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the opportunity to come here and speak to all of you. I'm not going to talk about my organization now, but I'm happy to take questions about that afterwards. Uh, so in the interest of provocation, I'm going to focus on Europe and what I've called Europe's seven deadly sins. And that is seven to a degree self-made vulnerabilities, which increase Europe's exposure to political risk in 2022 and beyond. I'm happy to elaborate and discuss global risks as well in the discussion afterwards. So the first thing that I've identified is that an anti-liberal, liberal reflex, the imposition of new lockdowns and vaccine mandates, triggers social unrest and political instability um, and brings into being a kind of new phase in the kind of anti-establishment populist um, backlash that we've seen taking place in, in recent years. So the historical empirical evidence tells us that uh, pandemics do upend politics and geopolitics and lead to political instability and social unrest. And pandemics tend to last about three years. Um, and social unrest and political instability tends to peak two years after a pandemic starts, so 2022 is likely to be quite a tumultuous year. But we've already seen um, in 2020 a 10% increase in social unrest, uh, despite and maybe perhaps because of um, uh, almost universal lockdowns and curfews. In 2021, we've also seen an increasing incidence of political protest and social unrest. And these have multiple causes, and they can be economic, they can be political, they can be health related, but there's no doubt about it that COVID-19 has um, been an aggravating factor in all cases. Um, now, given the negative economic impact of the pandemic on incomes, quality of life, especially in many developing countries, uh, a spike in unrest is perhaps predictable, but I think that the reaction of policymakers and governments to the challenges of the pandemic have arguably made matters worse. And in some cases that might be because political leaders 
say Bolsonaro um, um, has played down uh, the pandemic, um, resulting in you know, pretty catastrophic uh, results. But we've also learned in recent years that protest movements um, in middle, that middle income countries are much more susceptible to political protest and social unrest because expectations are high and rising. And if we look around the world in recent years where protests have tended to, the incidence of protests has been greatest, it's been in um, middle income um, developing countries. Um, in other places, it might be that people in relatively poor countries have been subjected to authoritarian style lockdowns, curbs on civil liberties, and have struggled to maintain their livelihoods and protested against their governments. But we've seen in richer developed countries, um, which have been affected much less economically by the pandemic, and also have had the advantage of ready access to, to um, vaccines, we've also seen rising political uh, instability um, and protests, social unrest. And I'd say we're likely to see much more of that in 2022. And that's probably because there's a limit to the unprecedented restrictions on civil liberties and individual freedoms that people are prepared to accept in the context of rising pandemic fatigue. Now, in politics and geopolitics, um, the pandemic has acted as an accelerant of existing trends and patterns of behaviour. And it turns out that governments in Europe, which pride themselves on their liberalism, are quite prepared to do very illiberal things, such as making vaccination mandatory, either explicitly or by the back door. Um, and that's what we've seen, obviously, taking place in, in, in recent weeks. In Austria, the government has made vaccination mandatory from February on pain of a fine and even imprisonment. Greece is doing so for the over 60s. Elsewhere, governments are doing it by stealth through the back door by requiring proof of vaccination or a negative test to participate in public and social life, including not only cafes, restaurants, gyms, but also workplaces, public transport and so on. And now we see Ursula von der Leyen urging governments to follow Austria um, and, and, and impose mandatory vaccination. So there's a significant risk, I would say, of widespread social unrest, political instability in 2022, if more mandates are imposed. Um, I think when a, you already have a situation where um, anti-elite, anti-government sentiment is very widespread, the potential for these sorts of extraordinary limits on individual freedom to coalesce into a broader political backlash. I think that's quite significant. Populist parties haven't had a good pandemic so far, but they could begin to benefit politically if they can promote themselves as the parties of anti-lockdown libertarianism and defenders of personal and bodily autonomy in the face of state coercion in the form of vaccine mandates. And particularly if they can marry those things with other economic issues, you know, such as you know, um, the energy crisis, energy price increases that we've seen of late, measures to uh, meet um, climate target pledges and so on. The second um, thing I wanted to highlight is, um, and can you give me some warnings when I'm running out of time? Yeah. Uh, Russia, I want to talk about um, what I call a Russia blind spot, pushing Russia into a corner, um, and you know, my point here is it takes two to tango and only one to miscalculate to end up in a situation, a very dangerous situation. So, you know, what we're being told is that Russia is at it again after this unusual buildup of, of forces on the border with Ukraine. Um, we're being told that Russia is about to stage a repeat of its 2014 invasion, annexation of the Ukrainian peninsula of Crimea this time in eastern Ukraine. So what's going on and how worried should we be um, uh, about this? Or should we see the problem and the risk from another perspective? I think we should be asking more questions about the predominant Western narrative. Um, and it's easy to ask quite a lot of questions um, that, um, about that narrative. You know, it, do we really think Russia is going to invade in winter? If um, this is a prelude to an offensive. Would Russia not need more troops, air defence, not to mention more discretion if the intention is to 
catch Ukraine by surprise. I think there's other reasons to question it. The Ukrainian army is far stronger now than it was in 2014, and an invasion would be extremely costly for Russia in manpower money. It would be politically risky for Russia's president, Putin, who isn't as popular as he used to be at home. Occupations are expensive, unpredictable, um, and um, Russia would be invading a part of Ukraine where a majority of citizens were not, were not ethnic uh, Russians. Um, so what are the, the benefits here and what are the costs? If Russia's long-term goal is to prevent Ukraine's closer integration with NATO and the EU and to keep the West guessing about its intentions, um, presumably it's already gone quite far in achieving that objective. So what's the purpose of an invasion? Uh, Russia is also keen to secure European regulators' approval for Nord Stream 2, a gas pipeline that bypasses Ukraine, so invading Ukraine would surely put a stop to that. So what's really going on? I don't think Russia or Putin needs any excuse to provoke the West to meddle in other countries. It likes to keep everybody guessing about what's, what it's going to do next. But we shouldn't accept just as gospel truth the story, the narrative that's coming from NATO or the US line on this or on any other foreign policy issue. Um, Russia's point is about the West crossing its own uh, red lines with regularities. So we've seen that. I'm not going to spell out what's been going on, but things that are a big concern for Russia is um, the military exercises that have been taking place in the Black Sea region, the reactivation of a US artillery unit in Mainz Castell in Germany, um, which is likely to have been viewed with alarm in the Kremlin, and so on, lots of things, actually, if you care to have a look, that's been going on. So my point about this, final point about this, um, is that you don't have to accept this argument about Russia's red lines, but you at least have to take them seriously. Uh, and unless you believe that the national interest doesn't drive foreign policy, um, or unless you think that Western foreign policy motives are as pure as the driven snow and only Russia and other non-Western countries can be malign actors, I think there's a need to uh, question it. I, I don't think analysts should be approaching anything in such a kind of black and white, good and evil manner. Uh, we shouldn't hold a brief for any side, but we can approach an issue with certain principles in mind, um, which includes respect for national sovereignty, for democracy and so on. And as we know very well, the West hasn't always abided by those principles. So it takes two to tango. Uh, and that's the way we should look at it. And I think the, the big danger here is that uh, when we get this kind of tit for tat um, kind of warfare going on, um, ideological warfare or whatever you want to call it, and a military build up here, it doesn't take much for one side to miscalculate and for actions, uh, for, for accidents to happen. Um, you know, and unless um, uh, that is managed, uh, we could very easily see ourselves in a situation with uh, of an accidental conflict uh, on Europe's doorstep. Um, I've talked about two risks. Um, there's plenty of others. Turkey, balance of payments crisis, um, uh, triggering political instability in Turkey and perhaps some foreign policy adventures as well. Um, I think the Balkans with the withdrawal of the promise of EU enlargement, the Balkans is really ripe for lots of instability. Um, we can talk about that perhaps in the discussion as well. Um, and a few other things, I think the kind of culture wars going on between Brussels and Hungary and, 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 and Poland present lots of risk for the next few years. Thank you, Joan. Um, Preston, do you wanna take over? Sure, thanks very much. Um, a couple of these were covered already, but I'll just try to give them perhaps a, bit, a slightly different angle or, or, or spin. Um, but as I, as I run through our, our sort of key macro risks for the coming year and years, I think, you know, it, it's stating the obvious, but COVID is still at the top of the list. As Oksana said, we're not, we're not through this yet. It's gonna be, you know, another year or some such, depending on how you define it. Um, and I think one of the things, as you look at country risk, what the, you know, the risk that this poses is fairly obvious. Um, so countries have spent huge amounts of money on a whole, a whole range of things, from furloughs to stimulus to medical care to vaccines. Tax revenues have plummeted. 
And now growth is returning, but is it really returning as robustly as everyone thought it would just a few months ago? That's a big open question, but you know, it's, it's, it's certainly not, not in, assured, right? And we look at just even you know, the, the recent COVID spike in Europe and what that may or may not do to GDP growth. It hasn't really crushed it so far, but you know, it's, a, it's, it's certainly a risk that's out there. So I think COVID remains you know, top of the list. I guess somewhat relatedly, um, as a financial services business, um, you know, inflation is just you know a key concern for us and and you know and, and basically all market participants. And you know the narrative of main you know developed market central banks thus far has been that inflation is transitory because it's being driven by a bunch of idiosyncratic events, the post-COVID demand spike, um, supply chain disruptions, and spike in energy prices. And all three of those things should naturally go away at some point in, in the not too distant future. So the idea is that this is transitory there, and so you don't have to hike interest rates and it should be fine, right? Um, this transitory narrative, if you go back to the last spring, the transition was supposed to be over by June or July, right? And here we are in November and inflation is still high and increasing in many places. It's, 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 it's on the rise in, in the UK and Europe. It's kind of flattened a bit in the US, but it's still relatively high. A whole range of emerging markets are experiencing you know, big spikes in inflation. And I guess so, you know, the, the key question is when, is when is it no longer transitory, right? You, you, can, you can keep saying that these factors are idiosyncratic and will go away, but if they persist for years and years and years, then it's not transitory, okay? So that's, a, I would say, a key, key risk in market dynamics. And every, everyone, you know, even more than usual, people have their eyes on central bank policy, you know, the, the, the pullback of QE, but also when will, when will they raise rates? Uh, the timing of that, you know, what's priced into the different, different, different sort of yield curves. Um, it's, it's clear that markets are expecting some things that are not fully aligned with what um, central banks are saying. Let's just say there's a lot of uncertainty out there. A okay, third key macro risk I would say is, is, is US China. Um, and just to put this, I guess, in very straightforward terms, I think there had been a lot of expectation, particularly in markets, that with the in incoming Biden administration, that there will be some form of a reset in China relations, US-China relations. Um, what's pretty clear so far is that there hasn't been a reset. The sanctions are still there. Excuse me, the, 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 the tariffs are still there on all those Chinese goods coming into the US. And it's also clear that the US you know, views China as a, as a strategic rival. Now, the implications of that have not really played out yet. It's not been priority number one for the US administration, clearly. They're more focused on domestic issues. but. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't say I want to, want to paint sort of a doom and gloom picture in terms of tensions, but it's a, again a high degree of uncertainty, and, and you know the pathway to smooth, clear relations in, among the two, you know, two largest economies and 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 and, and political powers is is I think it's fraught with you know potential tensions. Um, next key risk, and I would say this is a risk for this year, but also many years into the future, is is I would say climate. And you know the the, the and, and climate change. Um, how to put this in political terms? I think you know there, there's a lot of agreement on the science now, which perhaps there wasn't in earlier years. So you know, so 197 countries have agreed that you know climate change is happening and something needs to be done. That's pretty dramatic. So that's a positive development. But I think we're now at a stage where you know the science is is more or less established. But now we have to get to the political and social questions, which are, you know all of you are so well trained in, in thinking about and getting jobs in and so on, right? So climate is one where um, there's just a lot of hiring going on, a lot of new thinking going on. And I think if you take it at, at sort of a mac macro IR level, you know, the, the key challenge is, you know, if you're talking about a context of cooperation versus competition, um, in that context, how does climate multilateralism work? Because it has to work kind of perfectly to get this done, right? And if you're if you're seeing increased tensions around the world among key powers, how does that how does that enable that to happen, right? It's it's it's, it's an open question and frankly a potential concern. So it's you know it's a giant collective action problem which requires you know huge coordination and let's say the prevention of free riding, right? Because that's in everyone's interest having the other people do it, but you don't do it um, as as a country. So that's just really you know begins to play to our set. Of, of skills as 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 science grads, right? So this, these are the kinds of questions that scientists don't answer, but political scientists do, right? Um, I would also add into that uh, that there are a whole set of institutions that need to be set up. Um, one minute, okay. And and 
to to sort of you know establish norms and and rules and so on and so forth. And this is you know these institutions are not in place now. And what will they look like? How quickly will they, will they evolve? Will they evolve and become effective? Good open question and one to watch closely. And then finally, at the country level, I think we've you know it, with the recent COP thirty twenty six meeting in uh, in Glasgow, we saw a lot about ambition, and we saw a lot about what is technically feasible. But then how do you marry ambition with implementation, right? So the implementation is the hard part. It's easy to say you can target some, some reductions or carbon neutrality by 2050 or 60 or 70. Following through is another thing, which is again, a, a, a political and policy question. And then on the other side of tech, what is technically feasible, you have to ask the question of what is politically palatable to, to not just governments and politicians, but populations. So you know what, what's in the cards here is a rapid transition of how economies work, right? So to get this done, quote unquote, properly, it's going to require a lot of dislocation and rapid change, and you know that is a, a recipe for political challenge and complexity. And uh, anyway, it's a I would say it's a, you know over the next decade, this this is the growth area in 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 the, in the risk space. And last but not least, for um, We don't do top risk in my shop. Um, so what I will try to do is to talk a bit about some themes, which are not necessarily 2022 only, maybe a bit more longer term. Um, on the emerging market space, for us, the question is, is whether emerging markets will find their way to grow again economically. If you look in the period 2000, 2010, the share of global GDP produced put together by EM almost doubled in that decade from 17 to 35% globally. The problem is since then, that figure has somewhat stagnated. Uh, so that is one of the quick questions here. Meanwhile, what we have also seen that debt has increased substantially in emerging market space. On average now is around 65% of GDP that has increased by 10 percentage points since 2018. Uh, in 2020 alone, 80 countries had to go to the MF to get some financial help. Uh, we're going to see more joining in 2022 and so on. Argentina, when you talk about debt, is always a special case. They're going to need more IMF money. It's going to be difficult politically. Uh, but the Sri Lanka could face a default unless they go to the IMF. By the first quarter of next year, we have seen already debt restructuring taking place in Ethiopia, in Zambia, in Chad, and so on. So the question is really, when we look at the post-pandemic era, is which emerging market will be the winners, the losers, and the stars? Because now we realize that everything we thought we knew from, you know, acronyms like the BRICS, the MINT, the CIVETs, that was all nonsense, essentially. And I think politics here will play a key part in deciding who's gonna be winning and losing. Um, to stay in the emerging market space, and again, talk about growth, the one issue is China. China has seen the economy slowing down over the last year. Um, there is a party Congress in November, and C has got an interesting dilemma in front of him. The economy has slowed down because of the housing market suffering. Meanwhile, he has promised with his common prosperity, affordable housing. So what is going to do? Is he going to help the real estate sector and potentially create a real estate bubble? Or is he going to stick to his common prosperity agenda? And whatever happens on the economic front in China has got global implication. Um, the, other, the other interesting story in terms of EM, which we have no mentioned so far, is election in Brazil. When you look at Latin America, it's been a very difficult year already in terms of governance in Latin America. We have seen a bit of return of the populist in Latin America already in a few countries. So there is this big election in October. And it is interesting there because the two main candidates are equally polarizing. On one side, you got Bolsonaro. The other side, you got Lula. The question for us is whether the center can emerge and do better than the 20% is now actually gathering. Uh, because there are lots of voters potentially available for a centrist uh, uh, candidate. 
uh, moving closer to home, to Europe, in my view, I agree with Preston on the inflation front, but there is one thing that is interesting. If central bank screw up, they can fix it very quickly. Uh, it can do lots of damage, but they can fix it. They can put the printing machine on and it can be done very quickly. We have seen it. Uh, but if you screw up fiscal policy, it takes time to figure it out and to fix it, it takes a very long time as well. And in 2022 in Europe, in my view, the main story is a story that is not gonna grab lots of headlines. It's not particularly sexy. It's about the fiscal rules of the Eurozone. Uh, we have seen a suspension of them because of the pandemic. We have seen lots of spending done across the Eurozone. The current rules uh, on the fiscal side makes no sense whatsoever. You have seven Eurozone countries where debt to GDP is above 100%. And the, the seven countries together, they count for more than 50% of the GDP of the Eurozone. And meanwhile, the Maastricht rules tells you that the debt should be 60% of GDP. If Italy had to pursue that target for the next 15 years, they would have to have a primary surplus of 6%. Not even Mario Draghi can do that, basically. So is what is gonna be the debate in Europe? In which direction will go the debate in fiscal in Europe? Because in terms of economic policy making, since the pandemic started, we have seen kind of coherent and harmonious policy making. But now it's gonna become interesting because on one side you've got the Germans, and those hiding behind the Germans getting nervous about inflation, getting nervous about spending. And you got the other side, I say the Southern Europeans, but not only, who are still keen to keep rules a bit more kind of um, looser than they were in the past. And it's gonna be a very difficult debate. And, and that debate will have a very long-term impact in terms in terms of Europe. Um, final point maybe because we are in Italy, I'm as an Italian, is on what happens in terms of Mario Draghi. Um, because what is interesting for me that we, we have a country with around 165% of debt to the GDP. I can add another 10% right now. If I look at the credit guarantees provided by the Italian for the GACs, the securitization of MPLs. Eurostat is already trying to do that. Mario Draghi told them to stop, and they did for now, but this could come back. And everybody's very relaxed about this because Mario Draghi is there. But if Mario Draghi goes, that would become interesting. And if Italy becomes interesting, the Eurozone becomes interesting. Um, one risk, which I, I actually don't think is going to materialize, there is lots of stories saying if Mario Draghi becomes president, we're going to have a re-election. No, I don't think we're going to have an election 2022. Uh, none of the parties, apart from one, has got a strong interest in a re-election. None of the MPs, actually, it's not correct, none. 73% of them have no interest in a re-election. Because if they go to election before the 24th of September 2022, they will not mature their pension rights. And if there is something I learned in this job, I will never underestimate the sense of self-preservation of the average Italian politician. So we might hear a lot about early election as a threat if Draghi goes to become president, but I don't think necessarily if he goes, we will go to early election. I'm gonna stop at that. Thank you. I see that we, um, you guys have actually converged on a series of important uh, uh, topics um, and th there's, there's a lot of reason why that, uh, that happened. Um, keeping the conversation about the um, pandemic on, on the table, I'm still wondering what is the level of uncertainty that we're dealing with here when you do your risk analysis? Because we went into the pandemic with a set of expectations, a set of scenarios, but we were talking at that time as well about uh, climate, about Russia, about terrorism, about uh, US-China relations. And now, uh, two years later, of course, we've seen some of these um, risks being amplified. But 
I'm not always sure that we are seeing new risks being created that are so obvious and, and completely um, uh, changing the way that, that we do risk analysis. So I think that my question here is, what are the new triggers for risk that we weren't talking about before, but we're talking about now? And I think Joan mentioned uh, higher um, um, social unrest because of the pandemic. Uh, we have discussed the increase of public debt, but again, these were there before as well. So I'm just wondering how are we to um, adapt all our analysis um, right now and how much from the old models and the, the old um, um, uh, risk assessments that we had before are still in effect today and you guys work with. John, do you want to start? Yeah, I don't think the pandemic in and of itself has created some you know, new risks. Um, I think that it's acted as an accelerant of existing trends and maybe amplified some of those as well. So some of the things that all of the panelists have talked about, um, I think we've seen how that's played out. So for example, in relation to the kind of big, you know, geopolitical question of the US-China rivalry, that you can see the way in which the pandemic, you know, not just because it started in, in, in China, you know, has, um, has become, the, the kind of pandemic issues being played played out through that um, through that rivalry. So, and I think all those questions have just become, you know, just crystallised, you know, for people over, over the past few years. And you know, the big question of, you know, will China displace the US as the global hegemon? You know, that question is much more now at the forefront. I mean, that was already there, and um, it preceded Donald Trump you know, this intensification of the ri rivalry, but it's arguably been speeded up. I think the other thing that speed, the pandemic has speeded up is this shift in the kind of global economic balance of power between, from the West to, to, to the East. Um, so, you know, that, that's going to, that's, that's been happening for some years, but I think it's accelerated. It's likely to accelerate uh, in, in the coming years as well. And then that, um, you know, with all the issues flowing from the pandemic to do with supply chains and, and so on, you know, brings to the fore the question of will there be a decoupling? You know, so that whole discussion of globalization has be, has moved forward, you know, again. The question of will there be a bifurcation of the global order, you know, where uh, countries are, you know, ultimately have to choose, take sides. So we're still in this transition period, but all those questions are being posed much more sharply now, I think, as a result um, of, of the pandemic. So that's the way that I see it. So it's not we don't need to change the kind necessarily. The only thing that's new is that forecasters you know, have had to get to grips with um, all the epidemiology and, and, and so on and grapple with things that we're not really used to, to doing. And that was very important to do at the very beginning to set out what your, our assumptions were about the pandemic, about the vaccination timeline and all these things about um, uh, variants and so on. And I think we've, you know, that's been a work in progress and that's been new to incorporate that into, into our forecast. Yeah, I think I agreed, well, well said. Um, I think that one of the things that the pandemic has crystallized for, for, for me and my team, we've been discussing this a good bit recently, is that after, sort of 25 plus years of hyper-globalization um, and then on, uh, and then sort of, sort of a, a slight, slight stalling of that with, with the US-China tensions over trade and so on and so forth. I mean, what the pandemic highlighted, I think, was just this, 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 I, this, this heuristic that we're beginning to use more of, of efficiency versus resilience, right? So, this hyper-globalization period has been you know, characterized by efficiency. So lower costs, um, these fully integrated supply chains, just-in-time delivery, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, at the expense in many cases of resilience. And we've seen multiple failures of resilience just in the last year in the context of the pandemic, not necessarily always driven by the pandemic, but it's, a, it's an interesting timing, right? So you have public health systems, which are not very resilient in many countries, right? 
Um, and you know, the medical response times and, and capacity to even produce PPE in the US and things like this, just you know, not very resilient. Right? Um, supply chains, clearly not very resilient in this context, right, as we're seeing. Um, cyber threats, which Oksana referenced earlier. I mean, this is, it, you know, it just seems like every, every few weeks there's a new major case of this and it's just become the new normal and companies can't deal with it, right? And they're, they're begging governments for help, but it, it doesn't always, doesn't always work out that way. So it's so the cyber threats in a context where things are efficient but not resilient is is a is a real a real challenge. And, then, and we've also had also had multiple examples of you know electricity, power grids, pipelines, things like this. So I would so when people ask me, well, what is the next big risk on the horizon? I would say you know most of these risks that have popped up as as massive macro risks, no one was anticipating the financial crisis, 9-11, the pandemic, etc. So I wouldn't, you know, try to predict what the next one would be, but I would say that in areas where, you know, resilience is a problem, um, that's where we're, we're more vulnerable. Well, Fango, nothing surprises you, so how are you surprised? No, I, I, I look at it, uh, I'm gonna try to look at it from a different perspective. Uh, first of all, what is clear from the pandemic so far, at least that there is no winner. None of the countries has managed to the pandemic very well. If they did, they did it for one week or two weeks. When everybody talk about that being a successful model, remember South Korea in the early days, then it was Singapore, then it was Vietnam, then it turned out not to be correct. So if there is one lesson there, there is no model that so far can tell us much about how to successfully uh, manage it. Um, the, one of the questions for me is uh, who are, who are gonna be potentially the countries benefiting from this idea of reshoring, bringing home the supply chains, uh, maybe moving them from Asia to North Africa, to places like Turkey, maybe to Eastern Europe. So it will be interesting to see which countries in that front will try to uh, make an effort to gain something out of the reshoring. Um, and, the, 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 and the other question would be, who's going to be the next Vietnam? If there is a country that economically has done very well over the last couple of years, is Vietnam. And this because of the competition between the US and China is because they managed the pandemic kind of okay, but it's also because of lots of things they did domestically ahead of that. Um, so the question would be, who's gonna be the next Vietnam there? Um, when we look at it more at the, at the opportunity angle rather than the risk angle. Yeah. <clears throat> well, obviously a lot been said. Um... Maybe to say that, you know, when we look at risk, you know, at control risk or in my presentation, we mostly work with the corporates, you know, with the companies that are actually present globally. Um, you know, money in the financial sector, they do move quite quickly for many large companies, you know, making investments around, you know, where they place their operations or supply chains is a very long process. So as a result of that, even though we talked a lot about reshoring or nearshoring, in reality, there has really been very little reshoring so far. And what I think the new reality in which, you know, a lot of big corporates find themselves at the moment is that they are increasingly squeezed within those kind of two major risk drivers. On one hand, they understand that the world is becoming more fragmented, what, you know, Preston talked about exactly. Um, you know, they're no longer in a situation of uh, globalization, of sort of, you know, open trade, open flows of goods. On the other hand, you know, they're not able or willing, you know, to, to reshore because there is no functioning economic model which would allow them to move their production away from, you know, Southeast Asia into Central Europe. I mean, it just doesn't work from the, you know, basic business model point of view. So they are finding themselves in this rapidly fracturing standards environment where they have to cope with the fact that, you know, China and European Union and United States are now impos imposing very diverging standards all across the board, starting from data to the way they, you know, uh, approach localization, this whole issue of resilience of different sectors, you know, uh, so they just have to be able to oh, complying with ESG standards that I mentioned before, massive divergence all across the board. And they need to be able to comply 
with the standards and expectations of customers, market, and regulators in a very fragmented market. And this is the risk which did not exist in the same way before the pandemic, but something which is going to be there more and more going forward and something has to give in this you know model and if we if the co major corporates are not going to be able to deal with it this is where we go back to the situation that the recovery and economic growth is not going to be globally as ambitious as we expected and all the kind of vulnerabilities that the economies are facing in this environment are going to come to the fore all this vulnerable you know states be it brazil be it turkey etc they all are going to be you know more uh, suffering in that environment so yeah, I'm going to open the floor now for your questions and also for the questions online. I remind you to write your questions in the Q and A um, online. So, uh, who wants to go first? Was that a hand up there? Yes. Okay. No, no, you're you're closer to the mic. Take it. Well, thank you very much and if for you directed at someone specifically. Please. Happy let's... to. Um, Yes, and I've just been told to introduce myself. I'm Urvaksh Patel. I'm part of the doctoral program here at SAIS. Thank you very much for this roundtable. I think all of the points were incredibly insightful. If I may pick on one that uh, Dr. Keat, uh, Preston Keat, uh, highlighted, I think um, it was something very interesting. And the first time that I have heard um, about the need for greater cooperation among the, the multilateral system, especially when it comes to an issue like climate change. And thank you very much for bringing up that point. One of the things that you said was that there would perhaps be the need for increased institutions um, to help tackle this problem. Increased institutions is gonna drive more fragmentation and increase the coordination problem, in fact. Whereas perhaps what we need is to look at the existing architecture and determine whether or not it's really sufficient, it's tooled and geared up to address the problem in a much more um, coordinated way, essentially. So just curious on your thoughts as to why you think we might need more institutions to help tackle this, or if perhaps there would be a better, more elegant solution to use the existing architecture, more coordination around what's an increasingly challenging problem. Thank you once again. Sure, I mean, just that this sort of very spec speculative, but I, I mean, I think that, you know, you can envision adapting current institutions to tackle this program or the, 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 this set of challenges more effectively, you know, I guess starting with the UN, but, you know, other bodies. Um, and I think there are also, you know, there are a whole bunch of pricing mechanisms for carbon that could be set up, not necessarily as institutions, but just sort of norms and rules. And, what, and once you have those in play, that would just, I think, you know, potentially facilitate the type of cooperation you're yeah thinking of but yeah i mean i don't think you need a whole giant new climate bureaucracy but uh you have to be you know, creative in thinking about how you can i think partially repurpose existing institutions and again i, th I think a lot of this really will come down to whether let's say the key big players and just to simplify i would say the, you know china the us and the eu whether they can roughly get on the same page and, and, and get aligned on, on, on what the key objectives are. And I think, you know, the, 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 those three blocks collectively can exert a lot of formal and informal pressure and influence to get others to, you know, stay on board, so to speak. So that, you know, there's a path to solving this giant collective action problem, I think. But if, and, and if you, again, if those three players are aligned, and some would argue that they're, they're much more aligned now than they were a few years ago. Um, and certainly than they were during the time of the Paris Accords. Um, so I guess the optimistic take is there's, there's, there's progress on that front. And um, yeah, are, are you doing your dissertation on, on the, <laughs> this theme? That's a super informed question. <laughs> oh yeah, just a quick um, observation about this. Um, I mean, I, this is a, a really big question. Um, and I guess, um, <laughs> I, when I think about it, somebody recently said, uh, I, was, I was on another panel and somebody said that climate is going to be the mother of all geopolitical battles. And I think, um, unfortunately, that may well prove to be the case. And I don't know if people remember that before the pandemic actually happened, the assumption was that if there were a pandemic, that would be 
the thing around which there'd be this great, you know, flowering of international Should cooperation, <laughs> international cooperation and multilateralism and so on. And in fact, you know, we saw the, the very opposite, that the pandemic became the occasion for this intensification of, of rivalries, um, you know, and especially between the, the US and, and China and how institutions became subject, you know, to those rivals. And we see that rivalry being played out in just about every single institution. So much as we would, you know, hope to see that um, more cooperation, um, you know, there are obviously really quite fundamental um, differing national interests at stake here. There's a big divide between, you know, developing countries, which are being asked to, you know, stop doing things that are going to have a material impact on their uh, development. So I think it's going to be a very, very big ask, you know, to get that sort of cooperation. Very quick point. I think it's also that there is a lot of convergence around long-term goals and long-term objectives, but there is little convergence about what needs to be done in the next, you know, two to three to five years. So, you know, and I think that's that's where um, a lot of I think tensions are going to continue to build up. Partly because there is still, you know, uh, no uh, readiness. I think from the most developed uh, economies in the world, you know, to, to assume responsibility that they should not only for mitigation of climate change for many developing nations, but for adaptation, because we are already very much in adaptation game. And for many, you know, businesses around the world, that is the issue of stranded assets based on, you know, the climate impacts, which I, as I said in my presentation, are going to accelerate, not by 2050 or 60, but going to accelerate already in the next few years. And we already seen arguably accelerated just over the course of the last few years. We just didn't notice that so much because of the pandemic. And this is where I think there is no effective multilateral cooperation institutional mechanism which can make it happen. And if it doesn't happen, I think it's unlikely that we are going to develop you know, effective cooperation over 2050 or 2060 time horizon. Thank you. I think Rob had a question and we have two questions online. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, say both and then Rob, you can ask yours. So the first question is about opportunities, uh, which they, they don't specify exactly what opportunities, but with great risk comes great opportunities, right? So um, it could be someone who's looking to invest and make some money. Um, or if you're talking about the opportunity of countries improving um, their, um, uh, their own strength and their own institutional strength, let's say. So um, that's one. And the other one um, is directed to Oksana from Jonathan, uh, between our colleague. And uh, his question is about the rise of social and institutional fragility that you mentioned. Um, it's rather uh, optimistic. He is asking, well, would that instability be uh, resolved um, and how? And, um, um, and if, how do you predict that it will be resolved? And how long do you think we're going to have to worry about the fragility of these uh, middle and high income countries? So that's directed at you. The business and political opportunities is an open question. And Rob, please. Yeah, I guess this is mostly for you, Joanne, because you talked a lot about social unrest. We've seen recently, you know, two countries, two democracies in Europe, particularly Hungary and Poland, sort of succumb to populist nationalist authoritarianism where it's difficult to describe them as democracies anymore. I was wondering if you foresee another one of the more institutionalized strong democracies, either in Western Europe, and I include the United States in this question of sort of succumbing to a point where it would be tough to call one of them a democracy anymore, say within the next, you know, three to five years. Thanks. Well, thanks for the question. Oh, big question. Um, I mean, do it, the, the democracy index uh, last year, we, we saw kind of across the board, you know, big downgrades. Uh, in the developed world as well as the developing world. And that's because of this unprecedented withdrawal of individual freedoms and, 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 and liberties. Um, so countries were penalized um, on, on that score. And obviously there's been a lot of discussion about this democracy recession as Larry Diamond you know, called it as going on over the, over the past decade. And 
you know, that's certainly been the trend in the democracy index. At the same time, there's been some positive developments, um, I would say. I know there is this tendency to always see populism and populist movements in this negative light. I'd say that some very positive things have come out of it, regardless of what you think about those parties and organizations and political leaders, regardless of whether you think they have useful um, uh, um, prescriptions or solutions to problems. One thing that they've done certainly is mobilize people and actually um, ignite debates about important questions that have been neglected, you know, brought them into, back into the political arena. Um, and, and, and that's been good. Now, I would not um, actually label Poland and Hungary as authoritarian at all. And they're certainly not in that category in our democracy index. They're in the category of flawed democracies um and um yeah i know that they've been downgraded greatly by others by freedom houses and, and, and so on there's still as far as i'm concerned democracies they are still actually multi-party uh, democracies and you wouldn't have the opposition winning elections you know in budapest and other places if you know these were really authoritarian uh regimes i think actually this is a very big um, issue is going to become more of an issue in coming years, the kind of culture war that's going on, if we want to call it that, between um, Brussels and some of these East European countries. And it's not just Poland and Hungary. To one degree or another, you can say other similar trends are taking place in, you can see it a bit in Romania, you can see it in even the other Visegrad countries, particularly Czech Republic, uh, to a lesser degree. And you know what what's being called into question there is um, is there only this kind of one size fits all version of democracy, which is the one prescribed by Brussels, you know, or is there you know are, are there alternatives? And it's not just East Eastern Europe that's asking questions about that. Around Western Europe, we're seeing. I mean, obviously, we've got the UK, you know, who we've all, we had Brexit, but other countries are also questioning the. Um, the degree to which um, sovereignty, you know, lies with Brussels, you know, or or or, or with them, with the nation state, so Germany, you know, the constitutional court has also raised questions about um, uh, the ECB and ECB policies in recent years. So I think uh, this is something, you know, that's not just unique to Eastern Europe. Um, but I think that assertion of sovereignty, that's basically what they're asking for, more decision-making power. Um, it's what Orban calls illiberal democracy. He said that very deliberately, that he's out to create an illiberal democracy. And what he's saying, the difference in Hungary is that um, what's important for him is community, tradition, history, all the things actually that Brussels doesn't like very much um, at all. Now, I don't think that makes them a non-democracy or an authoritarian uh, regime. If I were in Hungary, I'd probably be asking lots of questions about what's happening with the media and what's happening with, you know, I think Hungary could probably afford to take a few more um, uh, refugees and so on. But um, I, I don't think, I think it's very dangerous to start labeling these, these countries as authoritarians and non-democracies. And I think we'll see more of this in other places in coming years. Well, thank you, John. I've been trying to tell them for the last semester that Hungary is not a democracy anymore. So that blows everything away. All right. Preston, do you want to take also the opportunities and uh, maybe both from the founder as well? Sure, just quickly on these opportunities. Um, this relates back to the sort of new era of, let's say, massive state intervention, which has been jumped forward a bit by COVID, uh, but also to, to climate. And I think that, you know, you, again, going back to those three big key blocks, the EU, the US, and China, each of them in their own way is trying to get out ahead of, you know, green technology and the, and the, and the next type of industrial revolution, so to speak, with huge R&D, expenditures, um, you know, tax incentives, regulatory pushes. And I think that there's a, you know, you, you could view it negatively and you could call it, you know, uh, climate nationalism. You could view it potentially positively and say, you know, these countries are all pushing for things which are seen in the longer term as public goods. They'll, you know, share them with poor developing countries. 
um, in order to you know help their companies be the leaders, et cetera. So I think that um, you know I mean, it's, it's a crude analogy, but it's almost like the space race of the 1960s, right? So you, you, you sort of flood flood the zone with money and and see what innovation you can come up with, and you and you try to become the leader uh, on, on a whole range of, of, of green technologies, you know from not, not, not even just the obvious ones, but even like systems integration and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so that's, that, that's, I think, the interesting one to watch. And, you know, there will be a lot of winners in those sec sectors, obviously some losers, but, but the, the it, you, could, you could also have a somewhat, you know, you know, more negative interpretation just in terms of, you know, if, 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 you, if you're divided up into blocks, you're not cooperating, et cetera. But I think there is a, you know, a whole range of opportunity out there. And, and, and one of the things that you, you see in, in, in the context of, of, the, of the UN meetings recently are that, you know, even big energy companies, which are, you know, in certain cases, rebranding themselves as um, energy project managers rather than, you know, petroleum extractors. So they, 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 have, the, they have the technology, they have the engineering, they have the, the, the project management experience to, to be at the forefront of, of of moving this whole project forward. Now that's, you know, that's, the, the, you can interpret that a, a, a bunch of different ways, but I think that's, a, you know, interesting opportunities, even for sectors that are supposedly in trouble. Right. Rosango, and also if you could answer a, another incoming question, how aware is the Turkish government of all the risks that you mentioned today yeah. and how prepared are they? And, and Wolf, can I answer that? Is Turkey still a democracy? <laughs> Uh, majoritarian democracy, uh, a new category uh, where the winners decide for everybody else and the, all the others should just line up behind. That's what Erdogan will, will say, I guess. Um, I think opportunity mean, depends on your risk profile. So I give you two high risk opportunities. Uh, one is Turkey and we'll get into that. The second one for me, and this is more long term, is about the green minerals because that's part of this green transition. We're going to need lots of minerals like cobalt, like copper. And so for Central Africa, it could be a very interesting play. But obviously, to go into Central Africa, you need to have a fairly high risk profile. Um, moving to Turkey, I think what is happening now in Turkey is potentially a big opportunity. Turkey is very cheap. Assets can be bought very, very cheap. Why I think is a big opportunity? Because I think here, um, that I believe that Erdogan, once he goes to the edge of the precipice and he will eventually get there, he will look uh, down and he will pull back. So there is still an element of rationality in my view that will kick in because the alternative, even for somebody like Erdogan, is, not, is too politically toxic capital controls, serious capital controls, not the soft ones that we have seen in 2018. In Turkey are, in my view, politically imaginable. Since 1983 in Turkey, they've been used to an, ex an open exchange rate. Everybody's a trader in Turkey. Before you leave your house in the morning, you don't check the weather, you check the exchange rate, Turkish lira dollars. And then that depends, that makes your day good or bad. So I think here Erdogan can push, he will try with this crazy experiment, but eventually we'll have to back down and then he will have to go back to rationality. Otherwise he's not gonna win the election in June, 2023. So it's obviously a high risk bet, but he can pay off very handsomely. Question. I've looked at Turkey for so many years of my life and heard so many times people saying it's it's cheap now, now it's cheap and he will change his policy and then Lira is keep on going down. So I, I, I somehow lost my faith in, in Turkey uh, as an opportunity as long as the current government is in power. But then the big question to what extent we're going to see, you know, much broader political changes. And then, of course, Turkey will become an opportunity. Um, I, I will identify three opportunities. One is technology, AI, quantum. We have a lot of liquidity now in the world. So a lot of money has been flowing uh, in various startups, not only in the West, but, you know, in the East and in the South around new technologies. And I think we are uh, on the edge of a massive breakthrough. So really in the next 10 years, we will see um, this kind of fourth industrial revolution really playing out. So there's a lot of opportunities there. And I think COVID did not stop that 
acceleration of that process, but actually perhaps even made it more attractive. Second, I agree with, with, with the person about the renewables. I mean, it's so incredible how the cost of, uh, you know, solar and, and wind generation has declined just in the course of the last, you know, uh, three years, you know, and it's really now going to decline even, decline even further. So the companies, the new technologies that are coming up in that space, I think is going to be quite remarkable. And we are really, hydrogen is another one. I mean, there's a lot of controversy around hydrogen but I certainly believe that this is a great opportunity. And finally, you know, more broadly from the country's perspective, I think despite of the fact that we hadn't seen uh, a substantial uh, uh, actual reshoring, we are seeing as a result of COVID the, the emergence of the regional cooperation dynamics. And that is really accelerating a lot of potential economic uh, you know, benefits in, in places like, um, you know, uh, but, uh, parts of Africa and South Asia, Southeast Asia, where I think the, uh, you know, the economic impacts in the longer run would be quite substantially positive. Um, the question which was to me about the fragility, is it a temporary phenomena or is it something long term? I certainly believe that we are now in the period of permanent state fragility at a global scale. And uh, in, in the North and in the developed uh, world, and I think it is driven not so much by the pandemic, but more structural factors like identity politics, like the rising cost of living, the impact on middle classes, middle classes being squeezed, and middle class, of course, has always been at the core of this kind of political stability paradigm in many democratic societies. The political polarization, which is driven by, of course, the social media and in the various, you know, environments that we exist now, the way that we consume information. Um, so, and of course, fiscal pressures that we all talked about, you know, uh, today a lot. So all of these factors are going to be with us. Um, and uh, we are going to see, you know, fragility across the board. You know, we are very far from that pandemic or endemic you know, COVID impacts. I mean, the British Institute published the, I think, excellent report talking about the COVID decade. And I certainly believe in that. I think we are, we have to think about the impact of COVID on, you know, the states, on political risk, et cetera, in, in the context of a decade, not two to three years. Do we have more questions in the room? Okay, Mandy and Cassie. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. My name is Mandy. Um, I'm with the uh, Global Risk Program, and I just want to thank you so much for, again, for being with us tonight. Um, this question is about insurance, so I just want to apologize for asking about insurance off the bat. Um, but I did notice in um, uh, the Risk Watch, in, under the cyber threat, um, there was a concern about the insurance industry not being equipped to have products uh, to address the large scale of cyber uh, risk that you know might be on the horizon. So I was just wondering what the capacity of the insurance industry as a whole is for risk mitigation. And I was wondering when working with corporate clients, if you see insurance as a, an easy win for corporations to mitigate without addressing some of the deeper, uh, uh, maybe more resilience or fragility issues, um, and if what the role. Uh, of that insurance uh, outlet is. And we'll take us this question and then have another one online and that will. Uh, good evening. Hi, I'm Cassidy. I'm also from the, the Global Risk Program. And if you can't place my accent, it is not uh, Australian and it is not British. It is indeed South African. Woo. Um, again, thank you all for being here. Um, mine's a bit of a broad question, perhaps everyone could add some input, but I will direct it to Dr. Keat. Um, just on, on COVID, I'm curious, uh, this whole new Omicron variant, and I see a few countries are kind of going into lockdown. If perhaps the risk firms have kind of, uh, if they kind of predicted another lockdown in Europe, do we think Europe, um, perhaps the world is going to go into stricter lockdown? And then building on this, uh, we had the head of Barclays UK here on Monday, and she kind of forecasted a really positive growth outlook for 2022 based on monetary and fiscal policies. And if we think with this new Omicron variant and potential lockdown, if we can still expect a really positive uh, growth going into 2022. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, sorry. 
Who would like to take the question <laughs> um, related to uh, the uh, the insurance? Yes. Okay, Oksana. Yeah, for the insurance. I mean, the insurance sector, of course, is now facing a number of uh, you know massive risks of their own. I mean, you know, of course, in my in my presentation, at least two, around two risks. You know, one is this extreme weather events and the impacts of climate change, which has really had a massive, massive impact on, on, on insurance sector um, and that will continue to, to have. Um, and the second one is the cyber, um, where, you know, we are now seeing, you know, catastrophic, you know, increasingly catastrophic and very, very costly cyber attacks in the situation where, as I was, you know, describing, the ability of states, you know, to help businesses manage those risks. You know, in the past, you know, certainly before the pandemic, there was a lot of expectations from, from business that, you know, the cyber side of risk, you know, on the macro level will be eventually dealt with by states. But nowadays we've seen that almost all states have failed to manage those, you know, cyber risks and, and they're increasingly leaving businesses on their own, you know, um, dealing with that something which is increasingly having a strategic impact so if you do not if we've seen recently with ransomware attacks etc and that's again going to escalate so for insurance sector it's very difficult at the moment to take responsibility you know over you know this uh, ensuring that kind of risk which as we know is going to multiply you know in 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 financial you know impacts so they need to become much more creative in working with businesses to develop a kind of functioning models but because so few actors at the moment understand the technology and intent you know coming from the cyber actors is developing so fast it's really difficult to you know you you, you put one insurance policy on the market and i think you know in six months time it become outdated because we see different kind of scale of you know attacks and risks so it is going to be a challenge i think generally for the, for the insurance uh, you know sector over the next several years for sure preston <laughs> now i can go thank you um Sure. So, on, on, I would say that you know the baseline of every mainstream economist, and including economists and banks, is that this um, recovery it will remain robust and positive through through twenty twenty two. I guess as a risk manager, um, part of my job is to come up with contrarian narratives that may, you know, maybe challenge that a bit, um, and I think. The first one is kind of obvious, which I think you already raised, is that you know if indeed this, these spikes and lockdowns continue in 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 Europe in particular, that can that you know that, that can't help growth, right? So I mean most 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 banks on the street have already revised down their you know their their European growth outlook a little bit, I mean not not by much, but yeah, again you could you could you could see the implications of of, of if you had proper full full lockdowns across Europe, obviously that's a a big risk, and I, I so I guess the the real public policy trade-off will be um, you know, the, 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 this challenging narrative of, of you know this this is this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. So if you're vaccinated, then go go about your business as normal, and if you're not, you're going to be increasingly restricted. I think we're seeing these types of rules coming in all over Europe. Um, so I, I think that would put a sort of a, a floor at least on the on the economic outlook. So we probably wouldn't go down as badly as you want it as it did as it did during, during the first lockdown, certainly. So that was just like a kind of a, a deep freeze but yeah this is a huge amount of uncertainty in these forecasts and no one is, is overly confident but i think the, the baseline is still that it's it's positive um i think that one cautionary anecdote that i've heard or or, or heuristic if you will out there is that you know china which recovered much more quickly than the rest of the world um going into quarter three this year had a massive growth drop off Right. So the idea or one theory is that, you know, there was a massive pent up demand that, that was then sort of released back onto the market. So everyone who had, hadn't bought a car for a year then suddenly bought that car. But that once that demand is, re is released into the economy, it's sort of a one time shot. And then the economy sort of settles back down. So if you, if you were to extrapolate that type of activity across the globe, then that's you know, a pretty negative view. Again, for, for, for a bunch of idiosyncratic reasons, China is probably not the same pattern as the rest of the world so i think you know economists are are are, are, are considering that but, but you know if you have to sort of highlight some risk factors i would just put that one out there you know there, there could be uh you know maybe maybe the economies have, have overcorrected a bit and and they won't be growing as strongly as everyone everyone thinks
Thank you. So unfortunately, we have to wrap this up. And I propose that we do that with um, a challenge to you guys um, to give me a one liner that I can hold over your heads as whether you've got it right or wrong one year from now, when hopefully you'll join us again. Um, and um, um, Volt started us off with, uh, you know, Erdogan will uh, back down or uh, but you, you, can, you can get, you, you have the chance to, to, to say another one as well. Uh, so I want a one liner that has the word will in it, X will to this, right? so that they also understand how important it is to write in this manner. And while you think about it, I have a question that you think uh, online that you may consider I planted there because it's about Romania, right? So, and it, uh, addressed to me whether uh, Romania um, uh, will uh, continue being on, in, in line with a democratic future or will it become the new Poland or, or Hungary? Um, a very important uh, country, of course, as we all know. Um, and uh, the, my answer will be that it will uh, will be worse and worse, but it won't become Poland or, or Hungary. It will be much more fragmented future, exactly because the elites are not as strategic um, in uh, making a mess out of the out of Romania as Poland and Polish and Hungarian elites are. So thank you for that that question. And uh, let's go to the one. Liners, predictions, future oriented, short. I would say the, 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 the world will learn to live with, with, with COVID, which will be, which is, you know, an endemic and it will just become a fact of life and things will move on and, and the growth implications are, are, are decent from that. Well, oh, that's very um, general. I'm not sure you'll get that wrong. How can you get that wrong? <laughs> Thank you. It's already happened. Thank you. Um, who wants to go next? Joan? Yeah, I predict that more... Um, sorry. I predict that um, more EU countries will go down the route of imposing mandatory vaccinations. And as a consequence, we are going to see um, a much bigger reaction um, to that. And I think we'll see very unexpected you know, political developments in, in, in Europe next year. I also predict that we are going to see a lot of trouble in the Western Balkans, number one, because the EU enlargement invitation has effectively been withdrawn. The U US has got bigger fish to fry and is not really um, paying too much attention to what's going on there. So I think a lot of things, um, not war, but other instances of, of um, political instability, we've already seen it in North Macedonia, going to, to happen. Um, the one thing I would say about Turkey is that it's not necessarily in Erdogan's hands. And I think the big risk related to the inflation risk is that um, we might have a faster than expected monetary policy tightening. Um, and that could cause all sorts of problems, do a lot of damage in, in emerging markets, um, in particular places like Argentina, um, and, and Turkey, especially if US bond yields rise faster than expected, driving up um, emerging market risk premiums and leaving them vulnerable to sudden drops in capital inflows. Um, and countries that are really heavily indebted in foreign currency are going to be particularly um, e exposed. And so all these leveraged countries, you know, would be... Um, at great risk. And I think sooner or later, we're going to see that happen somewhere in um, among the big emerging markets and you know, perhaps in the Western world too. Thank you for giving me the chance to edit you for, for once. That was not a lot. One no, moment. I know, I know. <laughs> um, Oksana? I'll give you three predictions. The first one is that Russia will not attack Ukraine. So very much, you know, following on just <laughs> analysis, uh, concur. And the second one is that Macron is going to win elections in France. And the third one is that the oil price is going to go down quite substantially next year. Uh, debt to GDP in Turkey is below 50% of, of GDP. So the debt crisis, if I compare to loss of other EM, I think is very unlikely. So if I have to make a call, uh, if there is something that brings down Turkey, is a depositor in Turkey going to the bank and taking the money out. So if, there, if the credit if Turkey goes down the toilet, it's because the domestic savers, savers have lost faith in Erdogan. Uh, 
If there is a change of Eurozone fiscal rules, I think it's going to be a very marginal change. If there is a change at all in 2022. Okay, so thank you so much for being here and making the trip um, across the channel, right? Because you're all from the island that shall not be named. Um, thanks, thanks a lot. And, um, and thank you guys for being here and to the people who are online and see you soon next year.